We begin with the crisis in Ukraine. Many new developments on this story today that is changing by the moment. President Obama spoke at the White House this evening responding to what's happening in Ukraine. Take a listen. I also uh, commend the Ukrainian government's restraint and its commitment to uphold its international obligations. Uh, we will continue to coordinate closely with our European allies. We will uh, continue to communicate directly with the Russian government. And we will continue to keep uh, all of you in the press corps and the American people informed as events develop. The president expressed concern about Russia taking military action against Ukraine, specifically in Crimea, where there is a significant portion of the population that identifies with Russia. To discuss this more, I'm joined now by Brian Becker, national coordinator at the Answer Coalition. Hello, Mr. Becker. Hello. So I want to start off. One thing that the president made clear in his speech today is that there's going to be consequences toward Russia if, if, if they intervene further or militarily. I want to take a listen to this part of the president's speech. Any violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity would be deeply destabilizing, which is not in the interest of Ukraine, Russia, or Europe. It would represent a profound interference in matters that must be determined by the Ukrainian people. It would be a clear violation of Russia's commitment to respect the independence and sovereignty and borders of Ukraine and of international laws. And just days after the world came to Russia for the Olympic Games, it would invite the condemnation of nations around the world. And indeed, the United States will stand with the international community in affirming that there will be costs for any military intervention in Ukraine. There would be costs, he just said. Kind of begs the question, what exactly is he referring to? What kind of costs are we talking? Well, you know, I think President Obama's speech was a vivid demonstration of unrestrained arrogance. Uh, I actually expected a booming voice to come out at the end and say, the empire has spoken, President Putin and all other political leaders within earshot bow, genuflect, and do as instructed on, on the Ukraine. And for President Obama to say it would be a profound interference in Ukraine's internal affairs for Russia to do anything in the Crimea is so hypocritical when you think that the United States and the EU leaders, particularly Germany, have interfered over and over and over again into the internal affairs of the Ukraine, promoting a coup d'etat, which led to the ouster of the current government and the seizure of power by a semi-fascist government led by or installed in power by a rump session of parliament. Uh, the United States and the EU are so arrogant, and Obama is telling Russia now, now, remember, Germany invaded the Ukraine in 1918. They invaded again in 1941 with Hitler who sent 80 percent of his divisions. The German imperial uh, empire along with the United States today is trying to reincorporate this big country, an important country, a big prize for them into their western sphere of influence and now they're telling Putin after having illegally carried out a coup d'etat stay away when in fact most of the people in the Crimea uh, are Russian, speak Russian, and of course Crimea until the mid-50s was part of this part of Russia and of course part of the Soviet Union. Yeah, Crimea is the part of of the country they certainly culturally, historically, politically identify with Russia. And it was there today that really was making a lot of headlines in the media, uh, reports of armed military personnel at the airports there in Crimea. Uh, what do you make of, of this, uh, the precedent that it sends? They're, they're really, really criticizing what's happening there in Crimea, speculating the extent of, of the Russian intervention there. I mean, when you look at uh, other conflicts in the past, Kosovo, Serbia, where th there was uh, intervention, I mean, how do you kind of frame that into what's happening today, looking at past We have to look instances. at it in a broader historical pattern. Since the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and for the last 23 years, the United States, the EU, what became the EU, and the NATO powers have step by step been moving east, trying to incorporate all of the former socialist bloc governments in Eastern and Central Europe and all of the former Soviet republics that were not Russia into NATO or into a Western economic alliance. And that's an attempt to isolate Russia, to dominate Russia, to create a, a, a ring of iron around Russia. 
and why the United States says it's because they're for freedom or democracy or some noble cause but the real goal is to be able to dominate exploit this resource rich and geostrategically important part of the world where the United States sees Russia as a primary competitor not because Russia is threatening the West but because Russia is asserting its own rights to have neighborly relations with countries that have been historically tied to Russia. This is economic imperialism and political imperialism that we've seen manifest today in the coup d'etat that overthrew the elected government in the Ukraine. And for Obama to say to the Russian government now, stay out, you don't have any rights in the Crimea, again, is an example of unrestrained arrogance. And now we have the, the president, the elected president, uh, his ouster. We heard from him today. He, he says that he is still in power. So uh, a lot of uh, a struggle for power there today. As I mentioned before, a lot of criticism today towards uh, from the West, outrage over what's going on at the airports there, what's happening in Crimea. But we d heard from the Russian ambassador to the UN today, and he, he spoke about uh, military, the military movement in cri Crimea. Uh, let's, let's take a listen to what he had to say about this. Well, of course, as you know, we have an agreement with Ukraine on the presence of the Russian um, Black Sea Fleet with the base uh, in uh, Sebastopol, and uh, we're acting within the framework of that agreement. I understand that my Ukrainian colleague uh, tried to distance himself from this uh, definition of aggression. If, in fact, uh, he were to, to use that definition, that would, of course, be completely unacceptable. And yeah, and he goes on there to say that uh, he's against any imposed mediation. Of course, we heard from Obama today taking a very strong stance, a strong diplomatic stance, saying the U.S. Uh, might not attend the G8 summit in Sochi. I mean, how do you see this playing out? Well, I think the Russian ambassador is completely correct from a legal point of view. Uh, Russia and the Ukraine have treaty obligations regarding that part of the Crimea and the, the, and the Soviet uh, naval fleet is there by treaty arrangements. Just because the West... Uh, using semi-fascist and fascist forces in Kiev could overthrow the elected government does, now not, does not now give the West the right to tell Russia that they have no rights in the Crimea when by force of law, which the treaty is, the Russians clearly have uh, rights and responsibilities in the Crimea, especially since it hosts their naval base. Now, it shows that the law is on the side of Russia right now, international law, but law doesn't matter. This is an expression of power economic and military power by the most powerful Western countries, NATO and the United States in particular, against Russia, hoping that the Russian government gives up its rights or acquiesces out of fear. I don't think they'll do that. Very contentious situation over there in the Ukraine. We're keeping a close line. I'd appreciate you coming on and weighing Thanks. in. That was Brian Becker, national coordinator at the Answer Coalition.